first let me bring on who you guys know. <laughs> uh, Sean, it looks like you're prepared for something, man. What's up here? This is Gabrielle Henson's source. We discovered hours and hours of videos where Sean Taylor has appeared on podcasts associated with the widely discredited QAnon conspiracy theories. As I found out that it wasn't just district attorneys. I found out it wasn't just judges. I found out that it went a whole lot higher than that. There, he shares his own bizarre speculations. You got Obama. Can we see that? Yeah, yeah, we're good. It's okay. open. Taylor claims to see connections no one else can see. These people right here on the top of this list should absolutely 100% be in Gitmo facing charges. And when he strikes out, like here, looking at property supposedly linked to Bill Gates. All right. So that's, uh, I'm guessing, some type of a fence casting shadows. Nothing that looks really suspicious. The lack of anything suspicious is, in his mind, reason to be suspicious. And when I don't have anything that looks suspicious, that makes me think, Something's up. Sir, this is about a criminal investigation, and we cannot discuss it. Neil Taylor has landed in Millersville as assistant police chief, promising to root out the corruption he sees there. A self-described gypsy cop, court records show the conspiracy theorist has bounced from town to town, sometimes keeping a job for just a few months at a time. And every time that I will go to an agency and start digging, they will always, as soon as I start showing them everything they shut me down yeah i mean you heard that right you heard it right that guy who started that clip off with his kevlar helmet drinking bourbon on a nut job podcast he's the assistant police chief of millersville tennessee which is just north of nashville on i-65 which is a major thoroughfare if you're coming from the north to get to nashville that insane story was published on may 20th and believe it or not believe it or not he still has a job and he's been conducting police operations that are completely illegal and a host of other bizarre efforts to prove his bizarre theories, his extremist views, his QAnon beliefs. And he's got the full support of his police chief, the district attorney, and the city council of his city. That's where we're at in some parts of our country. So why should we care about a conspiracy-obsessed cop in a town of 5,000 in Tennessee? Well, this week, the Republican, if you saw it, the Republican National Convention is unfolding and the MAGA way of the party is fully taking control. Tennessee has had a majority Republican rule for, well, decades, um, super majority rule for decades. And that has become, that, that, that majority has become increasingly extreme. For a lot of the reasons we talk about this show a lot, when all you've got is Republicans running, those who are running aren't threatened by the left side of their flank, they're worried about the right side of their flank, forcing them to become more extreme and more extreme and more beholden to guns and more beholden to big money. And that's where we're at in places like Tennessee. I've been telling you for a while, you can see the future of the US in the microsms around the country, like mine here in Missouri, where I live. I tell you a lot of stories about Missouri. I bring guests in from Missouri, like Rabbi Bogart, talking about the challenges of our transgender families here in Missouri. I brought you last week, the ladies from Oklahoma from the I've Had It podcast, who were just hilarious, by the way. Um, down in Oklahoma and the struggles they've had with Christian nationalism. So I wanted to bring the perfect guest in this week to talk about the struggles of rising extremism in a major U.S. city and state that is shocking even people who've lived there a long time and have had dealt with this stuff for many years. So who better than an award-winning, multi-award winning investigative journalist named Phil Williams to bring us that story from Nashville. So let's get to it. I am Fred Wellman. I am host of On Demise, the FPL, and that's where you are right now, right here on the Mize Touch Network or our channel, On Democracy Pod, right on YouTube, or wherever you get your Apple or Spotify or any of your podcasts. This is the show. Let's get on with it. Oh, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Fred Wellen. Still, I know I was Fred Wellen 30 seconds ago. Here I am still. Welcome on to Moxie with FP Wellman right here on the Myers Touch Network, where I get your podcast fixed. I am so excited to have this week's guest. I've been wanting to have him on for a while. You saw that crazy intro, right? And, and there's a lot more that came from, from Phil. And, there, and there's guests you always want to get on your show. And it's just a matter of the right time. And I thought after this crazy 
stranger than fiction week we've had with an assassination attempt and the RNC just in itself. I thought it was a perfect time to have an award-winning journalist, Phil Williams, join us. Phil is the investigative reporter for uh, News Channel 5 in Nashville for more than three decades, to include all the time I lived in Tennessee, Phil. <laughs> Phil has set the standard for serious investigative journalism at the state and local level. He's made a difference in his community year after year, earning him the industry's highest honors and praise from peers. You just won another award, Phil. Congratulations, I know, for your work on last year's election. Um, you know, I got to tell you, I got to tell our, our our guest about you, though, Phil. One of my favorite stories about Phil is that I've heard is that a prominent Nashville political strategist once said when asked about Phil's work, he said, if the press calls, just call your PR person. If Phil Williams calls, call your lawyer because you're in trouble. <laughs> and uh, and I, I get that as a former spokesman for people who got those calls. So, Phil, welcome to the show and welcome to the Myers Touch Network, sir. Thank you so much. You know, that, that sometimes makes it difficult to get people to return my phone calls. <laughs> I, I can imagine. <laughs> Again, as a former spokesman, I get that too. <laughs> You're all crouching by their computer and hoping you go away. <laughs> but you don't. Nope. That's your specialty. <laughs> you know, You know. I opened with that clip of Sean Taylor, and I love that. That's the very first story you did on this story. We'll open with that one. And and I'd be. Sh it's shocking. A lot of people may not know about it, but it, I like the story in the sense well, because it's crazy, let's be honest. <laughs> but just that one clip we showed, Phil, is, is your very first story where you kind of show him being on this podcast, being this nutter with a, a Kevlar helmet on, drinking whiskey. And then within 30 seconds of half, you know, half a minute, he's briefing people as the assistant police chief of a small town north of Nashville, which, by the way, has a major highway going through it. So you can't just ignore it. <laughs> you know, I-65 goes right through it. You know, you've covered some bizarre stories, but that one, man, I mean, that's a crazy story, isn't it? Yeah, and, and this is the first time that I've really encountered someone with this QAnon mindset who actually has power, who has political power, who has uh, power as a law enforcement officer. Ooh. And and this, you know, so, you know, he had these crazy, crazy ideas that, you know, everyone from George W. Bush or J George Bush Sr. to the Clintons to Al Gore and and Warren Buffett, all these powerful people were involved in child sex trafficking. And, you know, it, it wasn't that big of a deal when he was a nobody. But suddenly he has a gun and a badge and he's the assistant police chief in, in this department. Uh, and he's trying to use his power to prove his theories. And so... That's the first time I've ever encountered anything quite like that. Well, I think that what baffles me about it, and, and we'll work our way to that last piece too, is, I mean, you've, you've covered the story since May. I think May 20th was the first story, and, and it's ongoing. I think what shocked me as a person who's been a government spokesman, who's been a political uh, campaigner and everything else, been in the government, he's still there. Like like the, the city founder, the city fathers, the district attorney, of course, the police chief who hired him, they seem... Un, un, in, in no interest of, of heeding the warnings they're getting that, that he should go somewhere. He's, he really does have uh, the support of the leadership with almost unchecked power, doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. The, the uh, city commission has five members. Uh, three of the five members are silently uh, in his camp. Uh, and, and I'll tell you how bad it got. Uh, he had a podcast. Uh, in which he questioned whether the Covenant school shooting uh, here in Nashville, uh, March 27th of last year, that uh, killed, uh, resulted in three children and three staff members being killed. He had all these bizarre conspiracy theories about how the police video was staged and and the and the uh, the school employees who were helping guide police to the shooter were quote too calm, and just wacky wacky stuff. And even his boss, the police chief, defended him. So, you know, wh where, where do you go from there is, is the question. Yeah, and that's what kind of scares a lot of us with these movements, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm a pundit guy, right? And, 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 and it's easy to talk about them and some are laugh. I think what got me about the story is... Unlike, I mean, I've said it for years. I lived in D.C. when the Q, the the, you know, the the Comet pizza shooting occurred. So money, many of us have taken this seriously for a long time. But it seems like a lot of people in America kind of see it as a lark or something that's not funny. But in this case, you've literally got a guy with a badge and a gun and the power of the law behind him and the government behind him to pursue these theories. And that's culminated in the, your latest story, which is why I called you this week, where he put together a sting operation for child sex trafficking. But instead of doing it by the book, he brought in 
wasn't like these nut jobs from the internet, right? Uh, it, they, they broke uh, just a dozen obvious laws. I mean, tell, tell our viewers if they haven't heard about this, this latest thing you stumbled on, which is amazing that you found, you found the inside information. What has he been doing that's the most shocking thing you've seen so far? Well, I, I think this latest story that we've had, you know, may have some repercussions at some point, Finally. at least potentially, <laughs> uh, because uh, he, you know, because he believes that all of these powerful people are involved in child sex trafficking. He thinks if you can lure some sick uh, uh, perverts to to his town, to his community, that uh, you can arrest them and blow the whole thing wide open. Right. Uh, now. People who, you know, have real knowledge of this issue will point out, you know, people who are preying on the Internet are probably not the people who are actually doing human trafficking. It's two, it's two different issues. Right. Uh, but, but that aside, because he, he thinks the Tennessee Bureau of, of Investigation, uh, the Tennessee Department of Safety is also involved in the child trafficking, uh, he doesn't trust any other law enforcement agency but his own. Uh, and so he brought in this you know semi-vigilante group uh, called uh, Veterans for Child Rescue, uh, involving a former Navy SEAL, yeah. uh, Craig Salman Sawyer, uh, to, to, to run the operation. Now... Here's the problem with that. Under Tennessee law, you can make a case against a, a, a predator uh, if they're going after a minor or a law enforcement officer posing as a minor. Mm -hmm. Easy easy to deal with. You have the law enforcement pose as minors. Right. But Sean Taylor decided to let Craig Sawyer and the Veterans for Child Rescue people do the posing. Uh, and, and so that immediately calls into question any cases that they might make. Right. Uh, and, you know, the, just from top to bottom, it was ju just a clown show, to, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, they, they did get one guy who peddled up I-65 from Nashville, uh, supposedly thinking he was going to have sex with a 12-year-old girl. Um, and... And he didn't want to talk to police. And so they turned him over to this private vigilante group to do the questioning. Again, that's not how you, you do it if you're following the law. You know, any statements that guy you know made is, is going to be thrown out. Yeah. And and then the the I guess the one of the more disturbing things is you know, we had have these secret recordings where one of the de the uh, detectives is saying, yeah, we're sending this guy to the Robertson County Jail. He's probably not going to come out of there alive and boasting about it. Yeah. I mean, it's this it, it, it's there's no sense of constitutional rights in, in this conversation. Yeah, this is we're sending him somewhere where, you know, whether he's guilty or innocent, he may be killed and and we're okay with that. Yeah. And and that's vigilante justice, that's extrajudicial punishment. I mean, there's a whole layer of things there that get into some of our fears about where our country could go if we're not very careful. And these are people and, and I think what's disturbing again is going back to that point we made earlier, circling back, is he has the full support of his police chief of his district attorney, of his, I mean, I watched a story, they talked about pre-signed search warrants and a whole lot of things. And and I found it fascinating that I remember the lawyer you interviewed is your 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 station's like 15, two decade legal analyst saying, this is the most outrageous things I've ever seen in all the years I've been doing legal analysis. You know, it is it is outrageous. And and I guess for me, we circle back to, look, Millersville is what, 5,000 people plus, I think. It's not a big town. Yeah, exactly. What are people saying? Are, are there citizens that get it? I mean, at what point, does this become untenable for even elected officials who have that much power? Well, again, we get back to the political climate. Yeah. There are a significant number of people who sort of buy into these, you know, QAnon conspiracy theories yeah. uh, that they've got an election coming up this fall and, and we'll see where the community is. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any kind of a movement? I mean, and that takes us to Franklin. Um, when, you know, we go south of Nashville, the, the, the story you broke last year, which was fascinating as it unfolded with um, uh, Gabriel Hansen, I believe was her name, uh, running for mayor. Um, but she was sort of, I mean, that actually, that's actually, that's where the story started with Sean Taylor, isn't it? She, she right. highlighted Sean Taylor as her source. I remember now, <laughs> I remember she said, you know, so well, it all circles back. So for those who aren't familiar, can you tell folks about that story? If they're not familiar with what happened there and, and why it was so significant for your region? Cause, cause again, I, 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 I segue there because Millersville, of course, is a small town, a little bit north of Nashville. It's a little bit more red if you know the state. 
Franklin, well, the whole region is kind of red. Franklin's a whole different beast. You know, Franklin, yeah. Franklin ain't a small town, and it's certainly not. It's very well off. I mean, a lot of the country stars live in Franklin, don't they? Yeah, exactly. It's a very affluent community. It, yeah. it has a picturesque Main Street. In fact, yeah. so, so picturesque that there, there was actually a Hallmark uh, Christmas movie, I think it was, that yeah. was shot there. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, th- this is, and, and we titled our project eventually, you know, Hate Comes to Main Street because yep. th- this is the, the, this is a, a town where you least expect something like this because there's a lot of uh, affluence. There's a lot of education. Uh, and yet you had, and and everyone pretty much in the political world there is Republican yeah. or independent. Yeah. Um, there, there are no uh, real, you know, you know, blue dims flavors so, of Republican, <laughs> right? Uh, and, but so, so you had a, uh, a, a an incumbent mayor who's Republican, but then you had this very promising uh, Republican candidate for mayor who was challenging him. Uh, very media savvy, you know, had just the right looks you, you needed to, for a successful campaign, and it really looked like she was going to be successful. She ran on an uh, anti-LGBTQ, Christian nationalist sort of mm-hmm. platform. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, as we were starting to investigate her, investigating questions about her background, suddenly white supremacists show up at a candidate forum uh, to uh, to provide security for her. Security. Rather than repudiating them, she defends them and, and shares some of their talking points. Mm. Um, and Oddly enough, and you and I were talking uh, before we started recording about our strange lives that we live. Yeah. I I knew the white supremacists because one of them had threatened to kill me about twenty years ago. Okay, uh, and and so <laughs> it was kind of like homecoming with him. It was like, oh, how you doing? Uh, been a while since I've seen you. Uh, Long time uh, no see. <laughs> <laughs> but but because I have the history in this community, I was like, okay, I know who these characters are. Right, these are not good people. Uh, but she never really repudiated them. But I think here's the good news. The community reacted to the truth being told. Yeah. Uh, there was a record voter turnout uh, and, and she lost in a landslide. Yeah. So I, I think if there's good news to be found in white supremacists coming to this affluent uh, middle Tennessee community, it's the fact that, the people decided, nope, not in our town. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the normies can win if we organize and if we have the factual information we need, right? Which brings us to today, right? Which is the idea that you know there is a lot of misinformation out there, there's a lot of disinformation out there, and fighting that with good journalists like yourself, and you're you're dedicated to that, which is why you won the awards. Um, you know, and and that started with some. I mean, of course, her background was bizarre. I think you stumbled on originally. What was the fake? I think the first one was the social media post where she used photos of her friends that had never heard of her or something. <laughs> exactly. It was uh, she. She lifted a photo and claimed that they were her friends, and and and, and using uh, some AI search engines, I was able to track down the the women, and they were like, "Nope, we're not supporters." Um, don't, we're you know, in some cases, they was like. We've never met the woman. I remember. It's, I remember. It's kind of like I remember thinking at the time when you were in that story, Phil. It was like it's like those people who keep the the original picture and the picture frame they buy, right? <laughs> Look, here's my beautiful family <laughs> at the beach. Is that a price tag? No, no, no. It's my family. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, all my best friends, but they're black. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you know, it, it is kind of that kind of story. I remember being shocked by, it. and we laugh about it, which is the thing, right? We can, we can kind of laugh about it, but like you said, um, I let, I want to pull that pull a bullet you said out of there. Oh, I knew the guy because he threatened my life twenty years ago. <laughs> you know. And, and, and I think that's where we're at. And, and it's much bigger because you did say something before we talked too. what was the call you made your wife about that, though, Phil? Oh, um, yeah. At one point, uh, th- there was a, a threat that had been phoned in and police had uh, showed up at the house. And I was like, yeah, I just want you to know the police may be at the house when you get home, but there's nothing to worry about, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> uh, police being at the house and uh, and telling my wife there's nothing to worry about didn't quite work for her. Which is kind of where we are and where we are with the extremists. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a sponsor break there and we're going to come back and tell about your most recent story you did about that rising extremism and then tie that into what we're seeing in the state house as well. So with that, we have great sponsors as always here at the Myers, uh, Myers Touch Network and at On Democracy. We'll be right back. Hey, let's face it. After a night out with drinks, I do not bounce back the way I used to when I was in my 20s as a young officer in the United States Army, full of strength where we drink all night and then go working out the next morning. 
and lately it's been not as easy since I'm a grandpa now. That is until I found Z-Biotics Pre-Alcohol. Now, Pre-Alcohol is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by a PhD scientist to tackle rough mornings after drinking. And here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted to a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Now, pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to take, make your Z-Biotics your first drink of the night, then drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Look, I won't lie. Uh, I don't like hit the clubs anymore. I'm not that guy. But what I do is I take my partner and we go to outdoor concerts here in our town. We will sit down in the heat of the sun in the summer. We'll drink wine. We'll drink beer. And it kind of sneaks up on you. And the next thing you know, you're feeling a little bit underwater. So I decided to give Z-Biotics pre-alcohol a shot. And man, what a difference. Believe me, it is the real deal. So for vacations, weddings, birthdays, reunions, there's so much going on. Get the most out of your summer plans by stocking up on pre-alcohol now. So it's easy. Go to zbiotics.com slash Fred to get 15% off your first order when you use Fred at your checkout. Pre-alcohol is back with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for, for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So Z, I'm going to go back to it again. Just make sure it's clear. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash Fred. Use the code Fred, F-R-E-D, at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, as always, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and for the good times you helped me continue to have. If you're like me, you understand the pain of finding out what to wear each day. I mean, most clothes I have are uncomfortable, never actually the size I really am, and not to mention how much time is wasted trying to find a good outfit. And when you do have a good fit, you can only wear it for a few hours where you have to change for an important meeting or dinner, find a new outfit. Now, everyone wants to dress well at all times, because simply put, it's a confidence booster, even for men like me. Men's closets were due for a radical overhaul and reinvention, and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man, and here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion with the commuter collection, which offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, and polos. You never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan Commuter Collection. With Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can just ditch it all in the dry cleaner or ditch the dry cleaner completely, put it all in your own washing machine yourself. You know, I'm obsessed with the Roan Commuter Collection. We're on the move a lot, whether it's I'm catching a flight or I'm going to a meeting or whatever. The Roan Commuter Collection has never let me down so far. The commuter collection get you through any work day and straighten to whatever comes next. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to head to roan.com slash Fred. Use promo code Fred to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to R-H-O-N-E dot com slash Fred and use code Fred. It's time for you to find your corner office of comfort. Check out our sponsor, Roan. I hope you'll buy some outfits today. Great. And we're back. I mean, thank you, sponsors, uh, Z-Biotics, Roan. Man, I, I have the best sponsors. Oh, so, you know, we kind of left off with the Gabrielle Hudson and, of course, the, the death threats. And we, we, you and I laugh about those. I, and my, my girlfriend's learned what the term doxing means in the last four years. <laughs> um, you, you recently did a story, too, where and, and you've, you've posted, I've seen you on social media posting where you've had you've had, the I think, the Patriot Front guys came walking through Nashville. Um, I saw the guys, the actual swastikas on the streets this last weekend. I mean, openly marching on broad in Nashville, where the place I used to hang out with my my former wife, going to going to the, the, the country club, you know, the country you know dance clubs. And we did those things back on in my youth. Um, it's shocking to see. And you had a great story about what appears to be a rising momentum of extremists showing their faces in the streets of Nashville and, and, and openly displaying their racism. I mean, it, you've been doing this 30 years, Phil. I mean, do you do you sense a difference? Do you sense a rising tide that worries you? It, there, there is definitely a sense of it's become normalized, that it's okay for neo-Nazis and white supremacists to, to show up in, in the middle of downtown Nashville. I, I, I think there may be a couple of things uh, in, involved that politically, the, some of these groups see the Republican Party, especially the more extreme branches of the Republican Party, uh, as being more uh, aligned with their thinking. Right. Uh, you know, what, there was a group that marched through Nashville and they put out a propaganda video. Uh, and, you know, over the, the video, they had quotes from Donald Trump. Uh, and so they are at least trying to wrap themselves 
in the cloak of the Republican Party, whether the Republican Party is or is not, you know, doing the same thing. I'll leave that to others to decide. Um, but but there's definitely a sense of it's okay to come out of the closet, uh, to, so to speak. Uh, I, I think also that with the far right candidate, uh, the white supremacist candidate in Franklin, Tennessee, Gabrielle Hansen, she lost. Um, but they saw it almost as a victory, you know, that they got 20% of the vote and, mm-hmm. and they view that as a good start. Hmm. Uh, and, and they put out propaganda posts about that. Hmm. Um, and, and, and so, and, and then the other thing, I, I think there was someone in, and you may remember this at maybe at CPAC this year who declared that this was white boy summer. Yes. Uh, and and some of the neo Nazis um, that have been in Nashville this week, uh, I, I've seen video of them declaring that this is white boy summer. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think you have just people feeling like it's okay for them to be more visible. Plus, there's a lot of tension building toward this next election. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid it's going to get worse. Yeah, and that's our concern too. Heck, speaking of a music star of some sort, um, the year after the assassination of President Trump, Kid Rock himself was what did a quick video threatening, you know, threatening the the bad guys, the leftist radicals wearing one of those white boy summer hats. Um, mm. It's become almost a mainstream uh, thing. And that's the scary part, right? And, and you've seen, you know, I think Tennessee has been a super Republican supermajority state for a while. I mean, I'm not, forgive me, you, how long has the Republicans been in power there? It's been couple of decades, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah, a couple of decades. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm bad I on the dates off the top of my head. Yeah, it's it, it been a long time, you know, and, and I think a lot of people started paying attention to that, like you said, with the Covenant shooting, which led to the outburst of frustration from student you know, student leaders who organized, marched themselves to the state house, and I think the entire dynamic of the um, Republican-led state house of Tennessee burst in the national scene. Of course, with the Tennessee Three, uh, who I had a chance to interview um, uh, Gloria Johnson and others, um, they burst in the scene because they were they, they tried to oust, the, they did oust the two black men, right? Um, and so I think for a lot of the country, they all of a sudden said, "Whoa, what's happened in Tennessee?" I, I think you're right that there's that there does seem to be a a threat going through where they're seeing alignment between those two things. Do you think that, um, is this the most, is this the most radical you've seen? That, Cause you've done a number of stories too. I've seen about the cover-ups, about the secrecy. I know I've seen you complain about the fact that way they're kind of using state troopers to arrest them. I mean, was a mom arrested recently for, cause she had a cardboard sign or tell me I'm crazy. Oh, right. Well, and, and there were some people shouting from the gallery and she was just kind of swept up uh, with, with that group uh, because she was saying, I, I didn't do anything. I was just sitting here holding my sign and she refused to leave the gallery, you know, based on principle. And so she was arrested. Uh, but yeah, here's the thing. I, I think if you want to understand those sort of dynamics on, on the floor of the Tennessee State House, especially, it goes back to gerrymandering. Yeah, uh, because uh, the Tennessee House, um, you know, if you look at Tennessee politics, typically about 60 percent of the vote will go to the Republican in, in a presidential race. 40 yeah. percent or so will go to the Democrat. Yeah. So it's about a 60 40 state. Yeah. Uh, but but if you look at the state house, for example, I think it's something like 79 percent of the seats uh, are Republican. Uh, if you look at the Tennessee State Senate, it's more than 80% of the seats are Republican. And so by gerrymandering, it, 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 you, re, you get the more extreme versions of the, of the parties. Right. Uh, if people want to win the Repub- Republican nomination, which is the best way to, to win a seat, they've got to go to the extreme. Yep. Uh, and so you have gerrymandering that is pushing the parties, and is, I, I would say both parties, but especially the Republican Party, to, to the more extreme elements. Right. Uh, and, and I think that's what you see when you see the reaction you know, to, to the Covenant School shooting, for example. Overwhelmingly, Tennesseans favor you know, what are called common sense gun reforms. Right, but th- those are just not going to pass the state house because of gerrymandering. 
Yeah, and 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 that's what frustrates a lot of it. It's one of the reasons I'm involved. I'm involved in a couple of organizations: Blue Missouri, Blue Tennessee, Blue Ohio, mine, Forgotten Democrats. That's why the recognition that this extreme gerrymandering, that just getting a Democrat to even run. Uh, my friend Jess Piper says it really well in Northern Missouri that where her, where she lives, it's only Republican candidates. It's a matter of what flavor of can Republican you get, right? And so these these people you've got, um, they don't have to answer to the left per se. They their their biggest fear is the right. Somebody somebody being more extreme than them. So instead of a, a typical election where we have to think about the center, that that in the, in your case, right, the center is more extreme people, <laughs> you know. And you're right, and and they have been over. But you know, there was, and I like I'm an optimistic guy. I mean, people wouldn't believe that if they watch the show. <laughs> but I always try to end on an optimistic note. This show, and 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 one story that is an optimistic one. I feel like, and it's a little bit different. What we've talked about, but you, Tennessee ended up being one of the few places that did stop school vouchers. That people who were against the idea of tax dollars going to people to go to private school, but there was a pretty intense campaign to do so and the political dynamics that went into it um it, i, I like i know it wasn't one of your your top stories but you you did report on it is the idea that you guys did expose a lot of that backroom dealing that is going into this stuff right i mean how did that get beaten do you think i mean i'm, I'm curious how you saw it how did how did your state of all places with 79 percent of the house being you know would have voted for it how did it end up being stopped at that end I, I would say, and just as a note of caution, that the public education forces, the anti-voucher forces have won the first battle, not yeah. necessarily the war. Yeah, that's true. Um, because it was stopped because you have a lot of rural Republican legislators where their school district is the biggest employer in the county. Right. Uh, and, and so the, they are very protective of the public school system in those districts. And that was what stopped vouchers in this you know, latest go around. Uh, now you have uh, some big money groups that are coming into the current uh, primary elections uh, here in Tennessee, trying to defeat uh, some of those lawmakers, those rural Republican lawmakers who voted against vouchers. So that, that's why I say the battle was uh, won, but not necessarily the war. Yeah. So it's a question of the power of the local school system in those rural areas that has made the difference so far. Yeah, and that's the key because that's one we talk about a lot too. In this on the show, we've had discussion with other people who are school folks. Is it sounds great to have school choice, but if the only school within fifty miles of your house is a public school and it's being underfunded because of vouchers going to private schools in the city, you're not actually getting school choice. You're <laughs> you're getting school defunding, isn't it? And that is that one of the concerns that you think those guys had is beyond the employment. But the idea there just simply isn't private school choice, is there? Exactly. And, and, you know, here's my takeaway that kind of the, the good news for me is uh, I, I work for a company called EW Scripps uh, and EW Scripps has a motto that I think is perfect uh, and it's shine the light and the people will find their own way. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I think the, the lesson to be learned from my reporting is the more that we can shine the light on these backroom deals, uh, on who's trying to influence the legislative process, who's trying to take control of local governments like in Millersville, the the more, and, and, and with Franklin, you know, that, that was a case where we shined the light and the people found their own way. So I, I think the answer is to keep shining the light uh, relentlessly. Yeah, and that's what you keep winning awards for, <laughs> you know, and, and that was give me hope. I mean, the power of local journalism. And, you know, it's funny, and, and I'll tie it with this, is you tweeted this morning, by the way, as I was heading here, to, to, I'm, yes, I drive and tweet, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, that WPXI, I believe, in Pennsylvania seems to be the station breaking all the news <laughs> – about right. the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, right? I mean, including this, this they, they posted a picture today, I think, of what the phone and the transmitter allegedly was what they said in that picture. So it does go to the power of local news, the power of investigative journalism at the local level, which matters so much and tell that those story. So I guess I can say, for, on, uh, as far as I go, who's a fan of journalism and media, thank you, and uh, keep doing what you do, and don't be, don't be, uh, don't be put off by the monsters trying to shut you down. I guess the most important thing a lot of people will ask is you, you, you know, is they want to find our guests like you. How can how can our our Midas Mighty find you and, and follow your stories? Because I'm just telling my viewers now, you don't want to miss Phil's stories. <laughs> you don't want to miss any of them. <laughs> you know. Well, um, I, I'm I'm on all social media. Generally, uh, you'll find me as at uh, NC Five Phil Williams. Uh, and you know all, all of the uh, options: uh, X, uh, Facebook, Instagram, 
threads. Yep. And all your stories on the News Channel 5 website. I was up till 1 a.m. last night because I went down the rabbit hole of watching all your shows. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not I'm not embarrassed to admit that, <laughs> uh, which is why I'm bleary eyed today. But because every piece you do is fascinating, and educational and important, not just for low. And again, that's the point of the show, I think. I think the reason I bring guests like you, Phil, from Nashville to hopefully a national audience and sometimes international, by the way. Um, by the way, thank you, Australia. They always say hi. <laughs> um, is because of that very reason that the, the, the stories you're dealing with really are national stories in the sense of we are all facing these in different ways across the country if we can shine light on in places like nashville then hopefully we won't have to deal with them in places like st louis too so and, uh, and, and for, for your uh, viewers and listeners the best thing you can do is to find journalists who are doing the good work follow them support them amplify them uh keep the conversation going man I couldn't end it better than that. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for everything you do. Thanks for joining my show. <laughs> and uh, keep up the fight, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Now you can see why I wanted to have Phil Williams on the show. <laughs> you know, Phil's terrific. Uh, if you're not following him, you are making a mistake. Um, there's a lot of important news happening. And the fight for our country is occurring in these places. Last week was Oklahoma. Um, this week, uh, we were talking about Tennessee. We've talked about Missouri a lot. If you want to get a sense of what we may see if the MAGA movement wins this race, if MAGA movement takes over the country, Project 2025 is embedded, the laboratories of autocracy are occurring in the states. Just like my friend David Pepper says, former guest, you know, laboratories of autocracy are at the state level. Uh, the capital, the state house in Nashville, the, the small towns in Millersville, Tennessee, which you've never heard of. But I'm going to warn you, if you're driving on I-65, you're driving right through that guy's district. So just keep that in mind, his jurisdiction. Um, but again, that's why it's important we, for we need to know and expose this kind of stuff to the real world. As Phil so brilliant said there, we, we have to shine the light and, and we'll make our own decisions. So I hope, I hope when you watch this show, you, see, you learn something. You, you see something you haven't seen before and it's worth your time because I do appreciate it and I hope you visit our sponsors. In the meantime, I, you heard me mention Forgotten Democrats. Um, Forgotten Democrats has been blowing up this week. We've been plugging a little bit. I, I, the simple message is this. There's a lot going on in the country right now um, between the stuff at the national level with the RNC. We didn't get into that this week. I'm going to talk about that on Jason Kander's show here shortly. Um, in the meantime, there's amazing candidates running for office across the country. If you watch my show, the In the Hot Seat interviews, we've done something like 30 of them now. I just put another one up yesterday with a guy in North Dakota. We're highlighting these great candidates running across the country. And everyone I talk to, they all, there's never been a, there's never been a House candidate in the struggle for money. Uh, except for a select few, um, it could use your help. And Forgotten Democrats is a simple, simple thing. It's not fancy. We're not doing ads. There's barely a staff. I'm not paid. Our mission is to put money into candidates' pockets, nominees and pockets who need it the most first. The guy who has the least money, there's no questionnaire. There's no, you know, we have to vet them. If they're a nominee of the Democratic Party for Congress running this fall, and they have money, they don't need that. We have got enough to give them, we'll give them some money. And it, the FEC earmark allows us to do this. So, if you really do want your money to help candidates, be it canvassing or buying signs, throw some money at Forgotten Democrats. I'd, I'd love to have you join us there and, 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 and do that. In the meantime, catch all of our in the hot seats. In the meantime, the most important thing is there's a lot of crazy going on right now. <laughs> we talked about it a lot last week. I think I did a little rant. Um, my frustration with our continued attacks on Mr. Biden is evident and clear if you follow me on social media. Um, I am tired of it. I'm tired of delaying the fight against the people who actually want to destroy our democracy. I hope you're not participating in that dogfight and you've made your decision and that we're going to keep forward because the opponent is not our own party. The opponent is not the pro-democracy coalition. The opponent is Donald Trump, MAGA, Project 2025. If you watched any of the RNC convention this week, if you watched any of the RNC, you saw it in full display from that ridiculous rap video um, titled FJB to everything else going on, uh, the hatred. There's no unity, okay? None. And then you see somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene saying that she likes the Vance pick because they agree on everything, okay? The select D for vice president agrees with Marjorie Taylor Greene on everything. That enough should make you get the drag your kids and your, everyone else you know Give them a ride to the voting booth in November. So with that, I'll let you go. It's been a great week. Thank you. Keep up the fight. We'll see you soon.